this is the kickoff of a several day uh, symposium we have on sustainable infrastructure. And we are taking it on the road to Duke University. Some of the folks here are gonna join us over the next couple days in Durham, North Carolina. But today is, should be a really a fantastic panel here of folks to talk about sustainable infrastructure panels. And this symposium is co-hosted by Duke University, both the Nicholas Institute for Energy, Environment, and Sustainability, and the Pratt School of Engineering at Duke, also by the UN Environment Program, and by the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure and World Wildlife Fund US. And they're uh, all hosting the entire symposium. The, um, the, oh, and it is funded by Duke University's Climate Commitment, as well as the Schmidt Foundation, the Schmidt Family Foundation are also supporting the event. So thank you to our co-hosts and our sponsors. So what we want to talk about today is, um, oh, one final thing is this is being record recorded and we also have an online audience. We are um, going to be taking questions by something called Slido. <clears throat> and you are soon going to see a QR code uh, if you want to, if you think of a question throughout, if you're online or if you're in the audience, you're going to have an opportunity. Now, the QR code is not up yet. I will remind you again once we start. But um, in a minute, I'm going to introduce our panelists. And if you want more information on either the agenda or the panelists, that QR code will, will take you to it. So the issue that we are uh, looking at today is, I think... We all know there's a very large infrastructure gap within this country and across the globe, uh, nowhere greater than in a lot of these low income or lower middle income countries. But particularly post pandemic, there's been actually um, a fair amount of money pledged and quite a lot of activity right now towards uh, building new infrastructure in the US We've got more than a trillion dollars through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the, uh, the IRA, the Infrastructure Inflation Act and the CHIP Science Act and a lot of other countries. India's had a big uh, infrastructure building initiative. The G7 countries have pledged hundreds of billions of dollars through the Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment there's a lot of funds going into infrastructure and the infrastructure that is built in the next 10 years is really gonna determine how the world develops. And I think each one of these different commitments, uh, it's pretty clear there's often rhetoric around building the infrastructure that delivers outcomes for society and the planet. We're really looking for this infrastructure to help protect against climate change, to, to decarbonize, to become a more inclusive uh, world, society, et cetera. So, uh, and I certainly know all the members of this panelist, I'm guessing everybody in the audience is committed to, to building that. But the question is, how do we make sure that that is in fact what we're building? Because there's a long history of particularly large infrastructure projects not delivering those benefits that really were anticipated or really do fully benefit society. So that's what we're going to broadly talk about. And more specifically, we're gonna look at the role that standards can play. By standards, today we're gonna to take a very broad view of this. Standards being what we uh, agree on to measure this performance these benefits that the infrastructure, the way it's built and the benefits that they produce. That can be anything from industry indicators, metrics, requirements, all the way up to at the largest scale, the enabling conditions of countries and what countries uh, are the standards that they as a country provide for the infrastructure built. And we have this wonderful panel that really looked across that whole scope and the general 
panel discussion is going to have three parts. First, we're just going to briefly talk about do we actually agree on what that infrastructure that that delivers benefits to society, what that, what that actually means. And then we'll look at some of the standards out there. It's not that we don't have these standards. We have a lot of them. In fact, we have so many that it's a bit confusing. And if you don't agree on such standards, uh, if there isn't consensus, the lack of certainty can actually become an impediment to bringing in finance or helping developers understand what, uh, what is expected. So we're gonna talk about standards and uh, the role they play with different groups. And then finally, this question of where we're really going is, is there a way of um, bringing some of these different efforts together so that there is a very broad societal or sector specific or um, um, stakeholder group understanding of what are those measures that we need to help make sure that the infrastructure we are building is the infrastructure that we want and need. So that's that's the framing. I won't do nearly as much speaking for the rest because I've got all these great folks here and I just wanna take a moment to introduce them. We'll go one by one, very quick introductions. If you want more information on them, you can go to that QR code and I'll give you, I'm gonna give you very short bios. And of course, if you go to their individual websites, you'll have get even more. So sitting right next to me is William Phillips, who is at um, Mott McConnell, Mott McDonald. Sorry about that. Well done. Mitch McConnell. <laughs> Mitch McConnell, Mo McConnell. I never thought I'd hear that today. <laughs> Uh, who is an infrastructure procurement and sustainability specialist and has also, he's been involved, which he will tell you uh, during the course of the panel in multi-billion dollar uh, projects. And is he's also been very involved in PCRAM, which we'll hear in the development of a particular uh, standard that we'll be hearing about more next to him is Christina Contreras, who has recently founded um, Sinope, Symphonova. I messed up this, the pronunciation even though I tried, and she's also an instructor at Harvard. She has um, been very involved in developing tools and frameworks for sustainable infrastructure, has really thought a lot about this question over the years. She's been involved in many different countries, especially in Latin America, in helping uh, integrate sustainability solutions into projects and into policy. And Anthony Kane is next. He is the president and CEO of the Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure here in DC, and which and has been very active uh, in the development of Envision, another standard we'll be hearing more about. Uh, and Russ Singer is next to Anthony, and he, the Infrastructure Development Unit chief at the U.S. State Department, and um, he is at the moment very involved in another standard we'll hear about, Blue Dot Network, uh, which Russ will tell us more about soon. And then finally, at the last but not least, is Pratima Singh, who is principal with the Economist Impacts Policy and Insight team. She's come down from New York. Economist Impact is part of the Economist Media Group, and she has really spearheaded the Infrastructure for Good uh, standard, which we will also hear about. So uh, if you want more, go to the bios. Um, um, Philip, can you move to the next sure. slide? Um, while we are talking, if questions come to mind, Please go ahead and uh, through that QR code, um, add it in if you're online. You can also um, send us questions. We will take questions from the floor if you're not comfortable doing this, but it's a nice way to start to bring in questions, particularly as you're thinking. So um, I'd like each of the um, panelists to, for a minute or two to just give us a little introduction of your role in the infrastructure world and how it relates to the topic today. We'll go ahead and. Yeah, of course. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having us. Really appreciate the invitation. 
Um, so my role in the infrastructure ecosystem is the implementation of sustainability in our mega, mega programs, mega capital projects. Um, we um, focus on kind of how to practically get those outcomes achieved in the field. So I come at the problem from very much a boots on the ground perspective as an engineer in the, in the field. Um, we, we recognize the importance of standards and implementing them and the complexity that comes with the myriad of standards that exist in the marketplace and trying to stitch all that together is, is the, the, the part we play. Um, my role right now is I, I lead our infrastructure advisory practice. Um, and what, 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 what I currently focus on is kind of in, that integration between engineering and the finance sector, um, as well as kind of the, the government funding side. So we're integrating and trying to, you know, stitch together that those funding goals with the actual engineering on the ground, um, the construction on the ground, and making sure that all hangs together. So that's the role I play in the ecosystem. Um, and, you know, very much, very, you know, come from that perspective, actually implementing the solutions in, in the real world. Thank you so much for, for the invitation to be here. It's very nice to see familiar faces back in person and not just on the Zoom screen. So my name is Cristina Contreras. As probably many people here, I have several hats. Um, I started the construction sector many years back in Spain, working on the ground as an architect and building engineer, then moved to the US, worked for eight years as a research associate at Harvard University, being also part of the early creation of the ambition rating system that we are gonna uh, hear a lot more. And now as a consulting company, you know, we do a lot of implementation and strengthening of policy framework. So we help governments, mostly in Latin America, to know how to incorporate all these requirements or these commitments, because at the end of the day, it can be very overwhelming. We know that all those standards exist, but for the people that actually need to make those changes, it's not that easy. So we have worked in the past with Peru, with Colombia, with Mexico, with Ecuador, and with other countries um, on the implementation part of those standards that we are gonna be hearing about. Well, thank you as well. I also have to point out this, it's really nice as presenters to have such an amazing view. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, so the Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure, we were created in 2010 through a collaboration of the American Society of Civil Engineers, the American Public Works Association, and the American Council of Engineering Companies. And they really saw the work and the progress that had been done on sustainable buildings through uh, and architecture through LEED and recognized that the engineering and infrastructure industry didn't have similar tools and resources at their disposal. So they created ISI to in turn create, envision the rating system we've mentioned. And we work primarily with the infrastructure owners. So local governments, city, county, uh, utilities, transit agencies uh, that really, again, develop and, and own the assets, as well as their consultants, the architecture, engineering, and construction firms. Uh, but that's kind of our, our level of engagement and primarily through the envision rating system. Yeah, thank you as well. Um, thank you to Elizabeth and Duke for organizing and, and great to be here. Um, so my name is Russ Singer. I work, uh, as said, at the state, U.S. State Department. Um, I lead a team of four who work on projects to sort of help um, assistance to developing infrastructure overseas. Um, we have kind of three main tasks. One is coordinating with our U.S. agency partners who do a lot of, you know, we have a lot of agencies that have uh, extensive work in the sector and we make sure we're all coordinated on what we're doing. Um, but there's two initiatives that our office specifically leads. One is a government to government program to provide very flexible, fast acting advisory services on infrastructure. That's called the Transaction Advisory Fund. Um, and it's sort of meant to sort of fill in gaps between some of the more extensive long term programs that the US government offer, uh, offers. Uh, and then the one that I'm here that, to speak about today is the Blue Dot Network. This is an idea that, um, that the US came up with several years back and now works with a few other countries in advancing. It's a certification mechanism to um, certify that infrastructure projects meet international standards uh, on a broad range of topics, which we'll get into. Um, and, uh, and the end goal is to help those projects um, show, demonstrate that they meet those standards, but also to um, help attract uh, private investment for infrastructure development. Uh, so thank you. 
Thanks, Russ. And um, yeah, thank you, Elizabeth, for having us here. It's a great panel and um, a lovely morning to have this discussion. My name is Pratima Singh. I'm with Economist Impact, uh, which is part of the Economist Group, the newspaper. Uh, we combine the rigor of a think tank. So we do a lot of research and um, the reach of a global media brand uh, in basically engaging some of the most influential audiences, global audiences today. And um, I lead a lot of our work on infrastructure, in particular, the Infrastructure for Good initiative that we released and launched back in June 2020 with the support of our partners, um, Deloitte and Duke University's Nicholas Institute of Energy, Environment and Sustainability. Um, I can talk a little bit about the IFG um, framework, but we can dig into more details um, uh, over the course of the conversation. Uh, but essentially, just to, to highlight that we are uh, looking at creating benchmarks and ecosystems that enable those decision makers, those global policy makers to really invest in the right sorts of infrastructure and uh, a lot of the other big ideas there are out there around uh, buildings, electrification. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail at, at another uh, through the course of the conversation. So back to you. Thank you. Thank you all. So I want to start with a discussion of what is it that we're actually talking about. Um, we've mostly been saying sustainable infrastructure, but in different uh, different venues and different conversations, sometimes you hear about quality infrastructure or sustainable and resilient infrastructure or infrastructure for good. So we just want to start off and make sure we all sort of understand what it is that we're talking about. And that's really one of the issues of measuring is what is it that we're measuring. So I thought maybe start with you, Christina, to tell us, help us frame what is sustainable infrastructure. Thank you so much. Because at the end of the day, we need to set the common ground, right? Which has been precisely the challenge. So we have come a long way. There has been a lot of work being done by multilateral development bank, mostly uh, Inter-American Development Bank, UNEP, working on what is the definition. So this conversation started really back in the 90s as the MDVs started seeing that some of the projects that they were financing, maybe they were having unintended uh, impact, social and environmental mostly. Right? So it's like, okay, we need to do something about that. Then we started having some standards in the 2003 approach that is the equator principles that you all know very well. And this has really evolved with IFC performance standards and the really sophisticated frameworks that we have at the moment as is the ambition rating system. The good news here is like we are, and this is my personal opinion, getting to a consensus. Even though there are a lot of standards out there, but if we look back, if we look at the detail, many of the elements are common. So what we know right now and is accepted that a sustainable infrastructure project is the one that considers social sustainability, environmental sustainability, climate change, governance, and economic and finance. And certainly we can go in as much detail as we want, but one of the projects that we did a few years ago is look at different frameworks from nine different NDBs, like the Africa Development Bank, IFC, IDB, the European Bank, uh, and they all coincided in kind of 16 kind of indicator looking at biodiversity and the stakeholder engagement and climate and uh, risk. So we are there. I think that <clears throat> having all those four elements, social, environmental, climate change, and economic, we are on the right path. But there are a few other elements that we need to keep in mind. That is, all those elements need to be in place for the duration of the project. Traditionally, we have spoken about sustainability as something that happened in a given phase. So we have a sustainably designed project, and that's fine, but that's not enough. We need to have a sustainable project on the design phase, on the construction phase, on the operation phase, and on the, the commissioning phase. So the life cycle also matters. And there's one last element that is a little bit more recent, and it was kind of introduced actually with UNEP, as they were like reworking the definition that is <clears throat> making a space for nature-based solutions. Traditionally, when we talk about infrastructure, we understood that it was building infrastructure, great infrastructure, but now we know that doesn't need to be that way. It is green infrastructure that provide the, the environmental services that are needed, and that can be also sustainable infrastructure. And I will provide one more piece of information. Uh, last year, by the end of, I think that was around November, 
The American Society of Civil Engineers, they publish their standard in sustainable infrastructure here to, to, to be applied in the US. And they give it another twist. That is the possibility to consider the not built infrastructure. This is interesting coming for the engineering association. Right? <laughs> it's like, it might happen that the best sustainable solution is not to build the project if we have no guarantee that it's going to provide the, the, the positive impact that we want. Great. That was a fantastic <laughs> overview. Um, so, Russ, when we hear, say, um, the State Department talk about infrastructure, they often talk about quality infrastructure instead of sustainable infrastructure. Is that encompass the same uh, components or is that different? Great, thank you. Yeah, so a little bit, um, I would say a little bit more broad, a little bit broader. Um, and so when we talk about quality infrastructure, it really goes back to the beginning of the discussion about why we all recognize there's this big infrastructure investment gap Right? But we also know that it's not a lack of, of credit, it's not a lack of capital, it's a lack of bankable projects. Right, So when we talk to the private sector, we hear that over and over again. And so when, when the State Department started, when the U.S. government started thinking about could we develop a tool that would help address this issue, the first thing we did was to fund the OECD to do an extensive survey of the private sector so that we understood exactly what was contributing to the problem. And as part of that, um, the private, you know, that, that survey resulted in a lot of information about what kind of things the private sector is concerned about. So a lot of the issues that were mentioned were, of course, a part of that. So, you know, environmental, climate, social governance. But there were other things that were added as well, including uh, anti-corruption, uh, human rights, local community development, inclusivity. Um, and so what we decided to, what the State Department decided to do was to fund the OECD to do an extensive mapping of all of the different types of frameworks that infrastructure companies were using when they tried to design their projects. So we're very clear about saying the Blue Dot Network is not a new standard. It's a consolidation of existing standards, right? We wanted to give uh, project developers an easy to access project level tool that would capture all of the most widely accepted standards in one easy to use framework. Uh, and so because of that, um, you know, BDN is based on these 10 elements that include this broad spectrum. Um, and that's and that's kind of, you know, that's how we always describe it, to make sure that we're saying this is not a new standard. This is a consolidation of all the most existing standards, including the IFC performance standards, the QII principles, the equator principles, and so on. Um, and, and, you know, we always go back to that original survey that demonstrated to us quite clearly that uh, these issues such as anti-corruption and, and, and labor rights and so on are, are really important to the private sector. And so we wanted to make sure we built a tool that they would use and that would meet their needs. Um, and so when we talk about quality investment, that's what we're trying to capture, that broad spectrum of issues that are things that are preventing the private sector from potentially investing in infrastructure, particularly in emerging economies. Great, thanks Russ. And I'll just add to that, you mentioned QII principles, but you didn't define that. Oh, sorry. And just that stands for quality infrastructure principles, quality infrastructure investment principles. And the, the um, G20 uh, sort of took the lead on that. I think Japan was uh, was pushing that some years ago. Um, so, William, let's turn to you. I want to know um, how does resilience and attention to hazards fit into this discussion of sustainable infrastructure? So I'm, I'm going to borrow from some of my uh, esteemed colleagues uh, on the panel. And, and you know, we we think when you think about resilience, it's become a certainly a very popular term in the infrastructure sector. Um, you know, it, it means a lot of things, in a, to a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, I come at it from a more of a climate resilience perspective, but to keep things a little bit more general, um, you know, we would look at it from an engineering perspective as the capacity for our social, economic, and natural systems to cope with an event, any event. Now, in, in a climate change perspective, it's more of a, a natural hazard. It's, it's in a cybersecurity event, it's obviously uh, a different realm, um, but at the end of the day, it's about that, you know, that that response of our infrastructure systems to that event happening. 
Um, and, you know, in the development of our physical climate risk assessment methodology that we, we developed with the, the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment, um, which is closely related to a lot of our colleagues here at the table, um, we, when we developed that PCRAM methodology, um, it was actually quite similar to what Russell was talking about, which I think is quite powerful. We have all the tools to evaluate resilience. We don't need a, a new suite of tools. What's, we have all the mechanisms and the capacity to judge these things, to quantify these things. It's more about stitching all the different pieces together um, to make sense of it all so that we can translate from an engineer, what is, what is commonplace in our engineering principles and engineering sectors, um, and, and finding a way to map that to the policy and political and financial sectors um, and, and having that translation between these three, three elements. Um, so that's the that's what we we look at when we look at resilience is that that ability to cope to withstand to to rebound to an event any event of any kind and and then you know I can I can echo the comments of my colleagues here we all agree that those tools for quantifying and actually figuring out the problem exist um, we can measure resilience um, it's just about that collaboration that needs to occur and that's why we're partly here today so. Just thinking again about the terminology here, a question for the two of you. In your discussions, just curious, sometimes you hear people say sustainable and resilient infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Is that redundant? I'll take a first stab and I'll hand it over to you. Um, my, my belief is that you know when you heard us both speak, we kind of defined the framework for the different systems that are involved in the same way. And that's because, in my my opinion, resilient infrastructure is a subset of sustainable infrastructure. So I look at um, sustainable infrastructure as being resilient. Mm -hmm. um, does that echo your kind of feeling? Yeah. And yeah, I totally agree. And it's not that clear for everybody because, to me, at least, a sustainable project needs to be resilient, but a resilient project might not be sustainable. And let me give an example. Well, well, we might have a hospital that you need to have like batteries and like maybe a generator because that hospital cannot run out of electricity at any given point. It needs to be resilient because the life of people depend on it. To supply energy with a generator is sustainable. We probably will agree that it's not. So those are two different things. Even though we are talking about sustainability, you need to incorporate resilience as part of it. Well, just to jump in, if I can, um, I think one of the best definitions of resilience that I had heard recently was, uh, as Christina was talking about sustainability, you have the economic, social, and environmental factors, right? And and she said it has to be sustainable, not just at the design, but it has to be sustainable over the entire life. I think resilience, when we add that in, is recognizing that those social, environmental, and economic systems are constantly changing, right? Mm -hmm. So to be sustainable long term requires the resilience to adapt to those constantly changing social, environmental, and economic conditions, right? So in a way, you could imagine that resilience is sustainability over time. Um, and that's how I've kind of conceptualized it. I know there's you know many different versions, but I just wanted to share that. So Pratima, you use the term, or Thomas Impact uses the term infrastructure for good. Is How does that differ, or does it differ? Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think uh, just listening to resilience and sustainability, I think we can all agree that there has to be an element of that. But um, just to take a step back, and I think we can all agree in this room that it's very easy to understand what infrastructure for bad is. Uh, so I think that that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but when we started thinking about infrastructure for good, we were like, it's a little bit harder to define what good is. How are we kind of contextualizing this in the space of infrastructure? And so I think uh, to, to all of the panelists' point, I completely agree. I think infrastructure has to be resilient, sustainable, kind of a bucket there, um, has to take into account social and community impacts, and then also economic empowerment and opportunity. And so those are some of the pillars that we've uh, developed as part of this initiative and this barometer. Um, and then to the point that, that you made, uh, both Anthony and Christina, uh, there has to be an element of duration and longevity to it. And so being able to understand what are those foundational pillars, i.e. governance and planning, and then also sustainable financing through the course of the project, but also 
capital um, over time is really critical. And so those are so, sort of the five pillars that we've created as part of infrastructure for good. And so in a, in a, in a summary sense, that's how we define IFG. I keep coming back to it and talking about IFG. Um, the thing that I want to point out that's slightly different in the case of the Infrastructure for Good initiative is that, of course, we have a lot of measurements that look at project level indicators and standards. What we wanted to do is really understand what's that ecosystem look like from a country perspective to be able to enable good infrastructure, not just for each project, but more at a systemic level. How can governments and countries do that for all projects? And so that's kind of what we started examining as part of that. And so we've looked at 30 countries along these five pillars um, and then kind of examined how that play out. And so I think to, to the points of environmental sustainability and resilience, understanding if national or local governments are enabling that, providing support to be able to reevaluate those goals and KPIs for different projects, and really what other support mechanisms there are in place can help with understanding and defining that. Um, thank you. Uh, Anthony, so we sort of... Um, stepped beyond this question of what is sustainable infrastructure and started to talk about where different standards might fit into that, that uh, description. Could you give us a little bit more on Envision? You started to talk about it and exactly how does that sort of, what is it and how does that fit into this definition? Sure, well, one way I often talk about it is that one, we know that infrastructure development is incredibly complex and sustainability is incredibly complex, right? We're with many different factors. So when you start layering those together and say, we're going to develop sustainable infrastructure, the question is sort of how, you know, what, how do we measure that? How do we compare apples to apples? We have no consistent or had no consistent measuring stick. And that was really the goal of Envision was to provide a consistent measuring stick. There's a Peter Drucker quote, uh, you can't manage what you can't measure, and I apologize, Christina, you probably heard me say that about a thousand <laughs> times at this point. You know, you can't manage what you can't measure. Uh, and so having some kind of consistent way of measuring this. Now, Envision is a project tool. And I think what's interesting about this panel is we'll, we'll talk about how infrastructure hits at so many different levels, national, international, development, finance, governance. You know, so we are just one, with Envision, we're just one tiny slice of a very big pie but we try to focus on how do we give the engineers and the project teams the tools to translate big abstract conceptual ideas down into delivering a, an individual project, right? That, that meets those goals. Uh, Cause that can be very challenging. Engineering is very code driven, uh, regulatory driven. Uh, and so when you're asking engineers, we, we wanna do something differently. We wanna deliver a, a good, infrastructure project with quality and all of these resilience characteristics and sustainability characteristics. And they say, well, you know what, I've, I've been doing this the same way. What do you want me to do differently? They need, they need direction, they need something. And then they need something to kind of measure that off of and build on. So we did one infrastructure project a certain way. Can we do better the next one? Well, if we're, if we're reinventing what sustainability is on every single project, th there's no way to sort of build that capacity and skill set and grow. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of where we target our, our efforts. Um, so William, you mentioned PCRAM, mm -hmm. uh, but you didn't get a chance to say what PCRAM stands for, sure. and and who is that targeting? How is how is that actually being used? So um, you know, as a you know, one part of the Envision framework is the the climate resilience section, and that that element of a, any project. Um, you know, quantifying the, the kind of exposure risk that an asset might have when it's built is a very complicated process inside of a, a, you know, many other risks that you have to consider. So when you look at climate risk in specific, just quantifying that one element is, is massively difficult in an infrastructure project. Um, so what we, we with, with PCRAM, what we were trying to do is develop a, a very clear roadmap, much like Russell and his, his kind of stitching together a bunch of different standards that already exist and already being commonly used in the engineering space and stitching that together with kind of the climate science best practice of the day and financial um, economic benefit realization best practice that currently gets implemented on our infrastructure projects right now. 
So when you stitch together that climate science, the engineering good practice around risk management and quantification in assets, um, plus the, the financial metrics that everybody's seeking to kind of achieve, you can get and you, you map out exactly how those three kind of streams work together. You can actually put together a process that if you follow it, will get you to a quantifiable number for how resilient your assets are. So that's what PCRAM is all about. It's about taking kind of these abstract three streams that typically work independently and bringing them together to give you know, singular metrics that can be used to, is, is this project a good resilient investment or not? Um, so that's what the PCRAM is. Um, it's not new science, it's existing science and it's stitching together three practitioners that typically don't work together. Um, and that's actually the, the, the goal of many of our standards is trying to find a way to stitch together these independent practitioners that worked, work, do wonderful, amazing work on, in their own space and bringing that together in one unified kind of pathway to find what sustainable infrastructure is. That's really what we're, we're all talking about. Um, and I think that's what is so exciting about being in this sector right now is that we have um, we have the ability to stitch all those different levels um, together. Sorry to jump in again. <laughs> uh, I think also just before we move on, like one important trend that underscores and ties a lot of this together is that for for the very long history of engineering, it has often been viewed as a technical field and a technical solution driven profession, right? So. Uh, we have a congested street, so we need to find a way to widen that street so we can get more cars through, or we need to provide a certain amount of clean water. Uh, and I think part of what this is, is zooming out now and realizing we're not just solving a technical problem, we are delivering a value to a community, to people, right? Everything that infrastructure does, the end result is, is human beings, right? And so how do we take a more comprehensive view of, it's not about how do we move more cars through the street, it's about what are the transportation needs of this population, right? And how can we look in a more comprehensive and holistic way of, of delivering that service that is needed? And I think that kind of underpins a lot of the concepts around all of the, the different terminology. So this section that we are discussing now is the role of the standards. And my next question will be for whom? Because at the end of the day, as we know, infrastructure, it has like very different stakeholders. And the level of detail and the level of information that each of those stakeholders needs is different as well. So it's true that when we are working at the project level, we have great standards like Envision, but that's the best case scenario in which you have a project developer that is already committed to sustainability and he or she is looking for the tool that is gonna help them get there. But there are many decisions that are taken before that point, before we even reach that point, right? So the enabling environment is key and is crucial because we need to create the conditions to even have the conversation. And those conditions might not exist in a lot of countries around the world, right? So when we talk to governments in Peru, for instance, they say like, yeah, we want to do this. This is good for us, it's good for the economy and it's part of the commitments that we have already set up, but we don't know how to do it. How do we start the conversation? And that's something that is happening around the globe, really. So. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Pratima is shaking her. Do you yeah. want to add to it? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point, Christina. And I think kind of exactly what we're trying to or aiming to do with the infrastructure for good barometer is being able to say before we even get to that point where a project developer or someone has to come and say, right, this is what I want. How do I implement it? Are we thinking from a policy perspective? Have we enabled that question to even come up? And how are we being able to then support those developers or any other stakeholders really in asking those right questions? And so that actually goes back to the framework that we laid out, but really looking at governance and planning, um, specifically asking questions like, what kind of needs assessment have there been? Um, is there you know, cross-sectoral discussions? Are different ministries, because a lot of times we see in governments as well, you don't have a government or ministry of infrastructure, right? You have a ministry of energy or housing and other, other different departments. So how do we actually support or create that cross-sectoral learning, understanding, needs assessments, all of those things before we then just build infrastructure? And I think there's an example really of, 
um, a case study as part of this that we, we examined um, in Australia, so in the state of Victoria, where they have a 30-year infrastructure plan in place. And I see Matoko's in the audience, uh, and, and we discussed this at length as part of this uh, initiative. And it's really understanding what are the long-term needs in this population and what are those infrastructure assets that are needed to actually fulfill those needs and and then to the points of resilience and sustainability how does that have to evolve over time to make sure that those changing and evolving needs are in fact continuing to be met and so i think that that long game approach is really critical and that's really important from a from a government perspective because that kind of feeds back into that end. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would definitely um, agree with that point that that we've heard that feedback repeatedly that there, you know, sometimes countries don't even know how to to sort of start that conversation about how to incorporate all of these elements, particularly into the the priority infrastructure projects that they have that they're trying to develop. And so, in a lot of our conversations with the private sector about Blue Dot Network, you know, we had originally thought, okay, this is a tool for uh, for developers and investors. Um, a lot of them sort of came back and said, you know, this is a great mechanism for um, countries that are seeking to figure out how to do quality and infrastructure the right way to give them this kind of framework right from the beginning to start thinking about what are all the elements they have to consider when they plan infrastructure. And it's nicely laid out in a very clear framework that allows them to sort of just, you know, go through the process and say, okay, here are things that we have to do if we want to incorporate this kind of, you know, these kind of elements that we're all talking about in the development of our infrastructure. Um, and so we've we've sort of take that up, taken that on that recommendation, and we when we speak to, uh, for example, to other countries to sort of try and get them to join uh, Blue Dot Network, at least the, the governance part of it, um, we sort of highlight that as one of the elements, right? This is something if you you know if you have particularly if a, a country has a, a public private partnership agency or is looking to use blended finance to raise money for their infrastructure projects. They really need to know how to structure those projects in a way that's going to attract private investment. Uh, and so Blue Dot Network offers kind of that kind of nice framework that gets at a lot of the things that we're talking about um, and can be built in right from the start. So. Um, this is great. And there's a lot of different directions we could go at this point. But one of the. So what I'm just kind of going back to some of the different standards that you all have brought up, we've got metrics at the and then PCRAM and Envision are beginning to bundle them for particular users. And then we've got some uh, Blue Dot Network or Fast Infra, which is has somewhat of a similar approach, what I call a meta standard, which is even beginning to take the PCRAMs and the Envisions and link them with other pieces. And then you've got Infrastructure for Good, which is even, and these are just, sampling. I mean, there are a lot of other uh, standards out there that we're not going to talk about today. I'd like to just spend a couple minutes thinking from the user groups, how do you how do you decide what which of these various tools or standards to draw upon? And what is the um, what happens if you can't figure it out? I mean, why do we need what happens when you have too many standards? Who does it hurt or what is the advantage of it? Just talk a little bit about that. I might jump in. It's just, I guess, my personal opinion, a modification of that. I don't think that there's too many standards. I think along the lines of what Russ and William said, there are just many different players who all have their own standards and all of those standards in an ideal world need to kind of reinforce each other and link up. And right now that's not always the case or some players in the infrastructure development have standards and then some don't. So you're sort of passing it over and then the, the ball gets dropped. So, but like, for example, on, on our side at the project level, there's really only three in the world and, and we're geographically dispersed enough that there, there's no competition or anything or, or, or which one do you choose? Just choose choose one of them, you know, I, I don't care. You want to mention what the three are. Oh, sure, yeah. So there's a SQL, which is in the UK, uh, and IS, Infrastructure Sustainability Tool in Australia, both great tools as well. We're all kind of cousins, to be honest. Um, so again, I, I don't think it's a, I, how do you choose the tool? I think it's more about choose a tool, <laughs> choose a framework, choose a metric, use it, 
and, and grow with it, but more importantly, find out how your tool can link up with those upstream and downstream from wherever you are in the process. Um, that's where we see, because again, on the project side, we're a bit downstream, not all the way downstream, but downstream. And we kind of wish, oh, you know, uh, that's why I, I really like the Blue Dot Network, right? Because we wish that at the national, you know, code level and regulatory level and policy level that these things were reinforcing rather than hindering uh, achieving the sustainability outcomes at the project level, right? Um, so it's, it's are, we, are we kind of going with the flow or are we fighting upstream is, is really the value that we can get by linking all these together. Yeah, so maybe building on that, at the end of the day, different users, as I just mentioned, need different level of information. One thing is like, okay, in the decision-making process, you are like uh, maybe considering three different alternatives. What's the tool that you can provide? Maybe very little detail, which is the one you have at that stage and make the right decision that then is gonna build as you get more information down the road to actually build the project. So again, I don't think this compete necessarily. Then something that I would like to highlight, which I truly believe that is very dangerous. That is we are spending a lot of time kind of finding the perfect standard. Mm -hmm. And in that process, we are not applying the standard. So to me, it's more or less like talking about what's the perfect diet, but we are never really into the diet, right? So we are not gonna lose weight if we keep talking about like, we need to get into like, like or going to the gym, but we don't go to the gym. So as, as ambitious, as, no, ambitious. <laughs> as Anthony say, pick one, because by now we know what are the reputable, like recognized standards and apply it. And it might mean that you need to fine tune it. That's perfect, yes, fine tune it, adapt it to your needs. But don't, we cannot keep waiting around to see, okay, what's the perfect example? And not until I know that, I'm not gonna start work because the window of opportunity that we have, as we know, is closing. Hard to follow such great words, yeah. um, but but I, I guess I'd love to to come back to the, you know, the practical implementation of this on our infrastructure projects. And, and talk about the too many standards problem from my personal experience, kind of implementing these on mega programs across the US and in, in other countries. Um, you know, I think it's it's not an impossible task. Um, you can stitch together jurist local requirements, city requirements, state requirements with national requirements with Envision and make it all work. It's, it's very doable. It takes time. Um, and I think what's, what's, what's tricky about it is when we get into these mega programs, the business case was five, 10 years before, um, the metrics that we were measuring against are long forgotten by the teams implementing these projects in, in, in the real world. So actually I think picking a standard, again, I don't think I agree with you guys completely. It's not about picking one standard over another. It's about that consistency from that business case, 10 years as a, just an idea on a piece of paper to the actual construction work that's happening. And if you can successfully translate those metrics across that life cycle to the implementation phase through into the operations phase, as you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. that's actually the, the hardest part is staying consistent because over that 15, 20 year period that it goes from an idea to an actual thing in the real world, um, there's multiple terms for politicians, there's funding constraints, there's all sorts of change that happens. Um, that's actually the real hard part that we face. And um, you know, changing your mind 10 years into a thing that you conceptualized 10 years earlier is actually the most harmful thing you can do because then everything needs to be rethought. So um, what I see implementing this on the ground is actually that is our, our real core of the issue, not we have too much choice for standards. Um, pick one, stick with it, be consistent, take your metrics, pass it through the entire infrastructure life cycle so that when that contractor is sinking a, a pile, um, they know exactly why they're doing it and what metric they're trying to report into it at some point. So building on that, uh, so a really interesting point. If you are the developer of, of a standard mm -hmm. such as Envision or, or, or Blue Dot, or any of these, and thinking about what we knew 10 years ago, what we what we know now, and what our priorities are, are now, if Envision were stuck in what they did 10 years ago, 
we probably would feel that 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 pool wasn't serving our purpose. On the other hand, if you are a uh, developer or an investor, well, you want a certainty. You don't want a standard that um, six months they're going to tell you, actually, we want you to do that actually. So how do you balance when you're thinking about these, both what making sure you are uh, getting the goals you want, but also being able to provide a consistency for the, the, the community that are using them? Um, yeah, thank you. So just to go back a little bit to the, the previous question, and then I'll get to your, to the, your question. So for speaking for Blue Dot, I mean, we, we have two clear goals that, that we talk about when, when people engage with Blue Dot. One is, um, you know, we've all talked about the fact that there's so many standards out there. How, how do, you know, if you're a company that's just looking to demonstrate that you meet international standards for quality on, you know, ESG and others, um, how do you do that in a way that's going to be widely recognized, right? So, so can we create some kind of you know system that that is widely recognized that incorporates all of the other you know that is sort of a meta standards as, as you said, and that involves an independent certification? That's I think a real key part. And in our discussions, you know, when when the U.S. government started developing this with our partners, one of the first things that that the private sector said is there has to be independent certification because that's the only thing that's going to be credible. Right. And so that was inherently built into the concept of the Blue Dot Network. Right. So so, for example, one of our pilot projects was a, a data center by Microsoft uh, in Indonesia, and they wanted to show that this met all of the you know, international standards. And Blue Dot was an easy way for them to do that, that provided, you know, uh, independent certification. On the second goal, though, is, of course, again, going back to how do we address this this infrastructure gap in emerging markets, right? How do we get the private sector to overcome the obstacles and, and start investing in these projects? And so one way is to sort of line up a nice pipeline of projects that have been certified by an independent entity that they meet international standards, right? So, so again, another sort of nice way to just sort of say, here, here is a pipeline of projects. They've all met you know, independent certification for, for these quality standards. This should be something that should be active and, and sort of addresses the need that you've mentioned. Um, in terms of your question about how do we ensure that these standards are consistent over time and so on, I, you know, and everyone has sort of talked about this in a conversation about resiliency, these have to be living standards, right? They have to be constantly uh, monitored, evaluated to see if they're still consistent with current thinking on sustainability, resiliency, all of these different issues. Um, I think that has been sort of baked in, at least for Blue Dot, that has sort of been baked into the definition of the certification framework. Um, it, 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 you know, it will be updated annually to sort of make sure that it's still aligning with uh, what the current thinking is on all of these requirements um, and changed where necessary. Um, and the certifications that are issued are not just one-off certifications, they're reviewed, right? Uh, and so as they get reviewed, if there are things that have changed, then, then there's the option to either remove the certification or require additional work in order to continue to maintain that certification. Uh, and I think that's really vital to make sure that that certification means something over the long term. Oh, I think. Oh, well, uh, okay. I was just going to kind of layer on some of the, the other panelists. As you say, it was difficult to follow words. But uh, I think that um, the way we could think about this multitude of um, I guess standards is at least on some level there's foundational standards I would say and so those are some of the more country specific things and then you layer on those the meta standards like blue dot and then project level things like envision so it it almost feels like you have the baseline covered and then as projects develop in their pipeline the further you can go and the more you can can just uh, align with those uh, different standards the more progressive, I guess, or the, the better the certification would be for those projects. And I think to your point, Russ, the, the bit about these being living standards, I think is really critical because even if it's not so much that every year when you do that review, you see that things have changed, it's the fact that you're actually thinking about doing a review to make sure that you're taking into account any changing needs. And it, it could be very much that, great, nothing's changed, let's move on. But are we in fact, being critical about the fact that these things might need to change or you know something happened and we figured our resilience has to be redefined and then what does that look like? Yeah, um, I would just add, I think an important thing with the standard development because of the low uh, timelines, as William mentioned, it, 
that it, it's part of a, a broader shift that we're seeing within the industry as a whole as well, which is a shift from prescriptive standards to performance-based standards. And that allows for that flexibility, right? A prescriptive-based standard is gonna say, you have to have this size of a pipe, and you're right. A year from now, we may find new information that says that's not the right solution. Or, but when you focus on performance-based or outcome-based, then that provides a much greater deal of flexibility, both in time as well as in solutions. You know, so with Envision, I can't say that we were sort of wise, but when you started thinking about developing a system that would apply to all different types of infrastructure, whether it's a bridge or an energy generation or a a water pipeline, right? It sort of forced you into this performance-based thinking because the solutions are going to be completely different, right? Depending on the project, depending on the location, depending on the specific conditions. So I think that's another one with, you know, focusing on those performance and outcomes-based standards gives you that flexibility where, again, with Envision, we've gone, I think the last version we released was in 2018 and, and we've not had any kind of major hiccups because while our knowledge and solutions, again, get more refined, the outcomes are still the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in that spirit of consolidation, I think that it makes sense to just echo another certification that is out there that is past infra that as you know, you're part of the executive board, me as well. So at the end of the day, in that effort for consolidation, like the financial sector is saying, we want a label that is gonna tell us that this investment is sustainable. <clears throat> we don't have the time or we cannot go in project by project, but if there is a label that guarantees it's like what happened years ago with green bottles for instance right so i think that we need to be able to scale up all how the simplifications apply to projects so we don't need to go in depth in each of them but we can invest at scale in the projects that need to be set up um so we're gonna in a moment start injecting some audience questions but i have one more before we move to the audience and that is, it's a little bit of a shift, but um, as we get tougher and tougher and more refined standards, uh, whether at the project, all the way up to the policy level, clearly uh, part of the initiative is to help low-income countries. To what degree are these standards actually becoming a barrier to finance and actually blocking investments in some countries by raising the bar to a point that they're not helping these countries get the infrastructure they need, they're actually serving as an impediment. Just really quickly, I, I actually think it's the opposite. I think that right now there, there's a lot of capital out there and they're avoiding investment in countries where they feel like it's rich risk or asset types where they feel like it's a risk. And I think that these increased standards around sustainability in the developing world are viewed as ways to access international financing and capital to demonstrate that this is a, a worthy investment and that, that there's a minimal risk. And so I think it's a great avenue actually for, for increasing uh, funding and, and rather than a barrier. Yeah, thank you. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, um, the Blue Dot Network undertook, you know, a series of pilot projects to test out the framework. And that was literally the key question that they were looking to answer. How, how do we make sure that this framework is ambitious, but not overly onerous, right? That, it, that it's something that can be achievable by projects. And those projects were chosen in all different sectors, in uh, all different geographic locations, and all different sizes, purposely to see whether the framework was appropriate. And the results were really positive. We got very positive feedback from the smallest to the largest, um, including the idea that some of them said things like, this gave us a really great framework for thinking about these kinds of risks that we're gonna incorporate in all of our projects, regardless of whether we get them certified, right? Um, and even the smallest project said, uh, you know, th this involved some work, but was totally worth it in terms of avoiding some of the potential things that could have happened had we not addressed some of these risks. And so I think at the end of the day, you know, exactly as Anthony was saying, at the end of the day, if we're able to start certifying projects, if we're able to show that these projects meet international standards, investors will start to uh, be more interested in putting their money into these projects. Um, and I also want to echo what Christina said, you know, a lot of the discussions we have with the private sector say the institutional investors are not going to invest until there's a way to scale up. 
right? And so if you start to have certified projects, you can have really interesting conversations about, well, what happens if you start securitizing a, a pipeline of BDN certified projects? Uh, what happens if you start aggregating projects in a given country that have been certified, right? That makes it much more attractive for these large institutional investors who are not going to be investing in small, you know, infrastructure, one-off infrastructure projects. And so we see a lot of hope uh, and a lot of real interest in terms of what what kind of opportunities are opened up by these certification mechanisms. And my, sorry, no, well, I might jump in as well. I couldn't agree more with what Russ and Anthony just said in terms of some of the more emerging markets. I think we, we see the same thing even at a policy level uh, where I think being able to put those mechanisms and policies in place is actually becoming a competitive advantage for many of these countries to attract investment. I mean, we've seen some really interesting policies in Kenya around you know, ecosystem maintenance and South Africa as well. And so I think that there is a lot of that understanding that this can be used in a way where we can drive that investment, attract it, um, um, and then of course implement it by projects. Yeah, in my experience, the real challenge for developing economies is the enabling environment because not until we have the rules of the game in place, we're gonna start having sustainable projects. I can give you an example from a project that we did uh, together with the Ministry of Finance in Peru. So we helped them develop the national infrastructure plan. Traditionally, they have prioritized project and investment based on economic uh, parameters. And then they choose a project of X amount, or a pipeline, sorry, of X amount of projects, and now we want to make them sustainable. And like, you can. You have a train going through the jungle. I'm not sure there is much we can do to make it sustainable when we have chosen the wrong project. So it's really key that we start choosing projects and building pipelines, incorporating climate resilience and stakeholder engagement and equality and gender and all these things that we know are important because then it's going to be impossible almost down the road to say like, okay, now that we have the wrong project, let's make them sustainable. Great. I can say one one thing that, you know, I'll, I'll stray a little bit away from the precise question and say, like, even if we get bits and parts of it wrong, which is, you know, coming from a humbling myself and realizing that, yeah, we can make mistakes. The key thing, I think, which is what one of Russell's first points, which is we do pilot projects, we implement it, we reevaluate, we evolve. Um, if you if we realize that we're making a mistake, maybe it's not as sustainable as we wanted it to be after it's been built. The important thing is just not to repeat that mistake a second time, a third time. And so if we can you know, think, think in our industry is do a post kind of project assessment. And so one of the things that I think is core to all of this, to making our standardization work, to making our projects more sustainable is to acknowledging that we can be wrong, and to making sure that we learn by going back and looking at what the original business case said. Did, it, did we actually achieve our outcomes and acknowledging the mistakes we make and then improve it? And I think if we can do that cycle and improve our standards and update our standards to kind of reflect those that ongoing learning, that's what's going to make us successful. So Sarah has um, been monitoring the uh, questions coming in and she's going to help us if you all can So we've talked a lot about different standards from the project level to the country level, but there's a question here, actually there's a few different questions that ask about sort of cumulative project impacts and how these standards address uh, either from an environmental uh, sort of lens or a social lens, or I guess economic is missing here, but I'll add that in. Um, how, how do these standards address the impacts of multiple projects on a particular landscape or in a particular country. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So, you know, we start at the project level, but there's no doubt that the one of the clear goals of all of these, and particularly in the Blue Dot Network, is to establish global norms on what all of this means and, and, and to create the expectation that those norms will be met in order to attract investment. Right. So, and, you know, you saw that with sort of the lead, the lead thing, when lead first started, it was kind of a really shiny, nice thing, but eventually it became something that you sort of had to have. Um, and that's what our aim is for the blue dot network. This should be something that is standard practice everywhere. 
um, and that will clearly lift, uh, you know, all the standards for the level of, of quality and sustainability in infrastructure. I, I would just add, I think uh, this speaks to, again, the, the many levels and, and players involved, right? So um, resilience is a great example where you can think of is, you know, is the building that we're in resilient? Is this neighborhood resilient? Is the District of Columbia resilient? Is the United States resilient? You need all of those levels because if, if this building is just an island, but it doesn't have any power or water or transportation, it's not really that resilient, right? So there, I think that question highlights a real gap. You know, Envision is at the project level. We've talked about uh, national policies. I do think there is a gap in national planning or regional planning uh, standards, right? So how do we look at all of these systems at, at that scale? Uh, and there aren't, to my limited knowledge, there aren't that many uh, standards or systems that, that do that. Um, I have seen like, for example, Italy now has a national resilience plan. Um, but I think that they're, they're more of the exception than the rule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say that integrated planning is key and territorial approach is key. We cannot develop a port thinking that it's a port. No, a port develops a whole region in whichever country that port is implemented. People will need to get there. They will need water. They will need electricity. So we need to stop looking at project by project, and we need to start looking at how this infrastructure is going to change all this territory around it. And that's extremely hard, and there are not that many good examples around the world, unfortunately, but we need a strong governance and we need the right enabling environment and the, and the right long-term planning. So we talked a bit about, you know, just pick a tool and that's better than using no tool at all in terms of moving towards being more sustainable. But for those new to this space, I have a couple questions asking about if there's a tool to help you pick a tool. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, you know, is there a list? Is there a resource? Is there a person who can help you do that? I can comment on that. Comment that. Actually, we tried to answer that same question around three to four years ago, and and <laughs> you were like part of that of that effort, Rowan. So, GA said together with UNEP, we said like, okay, how can people navigate of this universe? And we put together what it was, what is called sustainable infrastructure tool navigator. So we did a mapping exercise in which we found 100 plus tools. They are all online. You can actually navigate, you can like um, identify, okay, this is for a transportation project, for an energy project, this is for an earliest stage, is open source, not open source, and through all that filters, you hopefully will get to the tool that works for you. Once we put that together, we have keep improving it because we understand that it might be also a little bit abstract. So we have done specific case studies in which we show people how some of the key tools we have done five case studies for now can be applied. So we did one on Ambition in a project in Canada. We did another one in Indonesia with Savi. We did another one in Ghana. So that at the end of the day is people can understand what was the experience of different uh, teams applying that tool, the specific one. So the idea is to keep in, uh, improving the sustainable infrastructure known navigator, but that information exists and is publicly available. And, and I'll, I'll chime in as well. I mean, you know, selfishly as a consultant <laughs> who works in the sustainable infrastructure space, um, you know, I think, you know, Tina and I both have experience doing this in the real world and implementing it. And so, um, you know, there are individuals and people with depth of expertise to help guide you on that on that journey. Um, and I think, you know, the, 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 the challenge is one that will never end because of the reason you brought up. Um, the standards are always evolving and changing and new ones are coming out all the time. So um, the landscape is never, you know, there's not one answer you can get today that will be true tomorrow, if that makes sense. Um, it's a little bit of a journey. Um, before you do another one, I'm gonna jump in with another question that I didn't get to, but I think sort of fits here. How, um, it's the question of trade-offs. And as you go higher and higher and start thinking of more different benefits that you're trying to uh, obtain, they don't necessarily all uh, go in the same direction. Some actually uh, are, are opposed to each other. Building a climate resilient 
project or system might actually be very energy intensive and uh, have poor uh, greenhouse gas emission. How, how do you help your clients think this through? How, as a developer of a standard, do you think of um, giving, uh, focusing on these trade-offs? Yeah, and I think, I think maybe starting at the, the actual nuts and bolts of designing a thing or building a thing um, in, in the real world, um, the, there's a massive challenge in that space. Um, I can give you many examples where, you know, the embodied carbon that gets emitted is massive, but now we've just made this asset so much more resilient for the next hundred years. That trade-off is a super complicated mathematical exercise to kind of quantify that additional carbon expenditure versus the resilient infrastructure and, and having that last for the communities that it supports. Um, and I don't pretend to say that we have all the answers, but what I would say is that if we don't try and quantify these things with real metrics that, you know, up front, then we're never going to get close to the right answer. So our approach and my approach personally is we, we always try and get as close to quantifying a risk or an opportunity as much as possible. Um, it's never going to be perfect, but you have to do that up front. You've got to check that as you design it. You got to check it as you're building it, and then you've got to check back again, as I mentioned, once it's built, um, and um, recalculate those metrics as best as you can using the tools that we have available to us right now. Um, th there's no, there's no silver bullet, other than taking a stab at it and trying. Yeah, I would say I think that's one of the values of the standards and the the frameworks, right? The the standards aren't there to sort of take decision making away from you and say, okay, I don't have to think anymore. I just follow the standard, right? But it's exactly that issue, which is the standards provide a consistent way of looking at those trade-offs. So you can see, okay, you know, here's all the things I can or should be doing. I'm not able to do everything, but at least now I'm aware of that. I've, I've made a conscious decision or I, I'm aware that I, I've failed or, or you know, not succeeded in certain areas. And next time I can do better. But in the absence of that, what you find is that you, you're just, you don't even know what you're missing, right? Um, and that's what we often see too. I know Christina's done this a couple of times is oftentimes you'll see people comparing, you know, overlapping different sustainability standards so that they can see where the gaps are. You know, maybe they're using one and they look at another one just to see, was there, is there something new in this one that we're, that we might be overlooking? So again, I, I think that's the strength and the, the reason for using these frameworks is more about being aware of those trade-offs. Oh, I, if you want to go in, because I have a different perspective to this, um, not to disagree with what William or Anthony said, but just um, sort of obviously at different project levels and very specifically, you can almost exactly what that trade-off would be, what that, you know, investment trade-off would also be. But even at a country level, you could think of, you know, when we think about environmental outcomes and, you know, fossil fuel and other things, but if they create jobs, what's that trade-off there? Um, and then one of the things we found, though, if we think about the outcomes of economic, social, and environmental, at least on average among the 30 countries that we examined, the one that seems to be the trade-off that most governments don't actually consider are social and community impacts. That's the weakest scoring pillar. And I think that's really where I would kind of focus or uh, recommend that we think about in a little more detail, whether it's project or policy or you know local level governments even, being able to think about the trade-offs as a result of our decisions on social and community impact would be critical going forward. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I think that's really helpful. And I think what I would say in terms of the trade-offs is that the value of the frameworks, you know, is that you see exactly what are the issues that you need to address, right? If you don't even know what are the issues that you need to address, including what, what Pratima was just mentioning, then it's very hard to make any decisions. So the frameworks lay out very nicely, okay, these are the things that we have to consider. And, and maybe it gives you the ability to sort of have those conversations on where you need to focus. Um, you know, in particular for the Blue Dot Network, the, the sort of a certification process is very much a risk-based analysis, right? Certain projects are just not going to have risks in certain areas, and those don't have to be, you know, you don't have to put a lot of energy or attention on those. But there are others that clearly might for that specific project, and that's going to be a place where you're going to have to devote a lot more energy to sort of meeting the requirements. Um, so I think the frameworks are really helpful in that sense of giving you the tools to have those conversations to know what are the issues that need to be addressed and where the trade-offs are. Maybe, well, sorry, just one last one. I know I've already spoken, but that made me think. I think another one is 
while there certainly are situations where there are unavoidable trade-offs, I often see that there's sort of what is initially perceived to be a trade-off by using standards and frameworks, the project teams realize, oh wait, actually there is a solution in there where we can do both, right? So I think also that's that's part of it. Not everything on the surface level is a trade-off. Uh, we have to think more creatively uh, and get as many of those trade-offs into you know both and. There are different terms for this popping up in the questions, but one thing that a lot of people are thinking about now is nature-based infrastructure or green-gray solutions or environmental infrastructure. How do these standards or do they um, think about those types of infrastructure options? I feel like I'm always jumping in first, but um, so we certainly encourage that. And it was an interesting conversation uh, that I had before uh, the presentation as well. I think nature-based solutions uh, are wonderful. We're really uh, supportive of that, encouraged and, and rewarded in, in vision at least. I think there's a bigger challenge though, right? Which is that we have a legacy of governance and professional training around heavy gray infrastructure. So when we start talking about nature-based solutions, it's not just how do we design a nature-based solution, it's how do we completely overhaul our, our agencies, our, our workforce, our skill sets to go from people who are used to designing, building and managing concrete heavy stuff to people who are familiar with living biological systems, right? That's a, that can be very different. Um, and, and the agencies and their funding and how they're set up to, to manage their assets has to, to shift, I think, to, to implement nature-based solutions. But there's a, I think it's a, a hot topic right now for a reason, because there's a huge opportunity there. We just have to figure out sort of how to put all the pieces in place to make it work. Yeah, if I can add to that, and if we kind of like go full circle to how we started, we think on the definition of a sustainable infrastructure project. At the end of the day, that needs to be including the social aspect, the environmental aspect, the resilience aspect. So the set of questions that are asked to a project that is traditional gray infrastructure or a green infrastructure are exactly the same. It's most likely that the ones that are green infrastructure are gonna score higher because they are adding additional values, but that doesn't mean that we are gonna look at those projects through different lenses. It's not, but certainly that's gonna have potentially much higher score. Anyone? Yeah. Sorry, I would just just quickly add to say that you know this gets back to the question of um, how do you balance sort of ambition with not being too onerous. But I think you know what what we've tried to do in the development of BDN is to sort of have the flexibility where there are levels of achievement. Right there's you can meet the essential requirements, you can be superior, or you can be best in class. Mm -hmm. And so certainly, sort of innovative solutions like we've talked about, you know, allow you to sort of achieve that kind of best in class. But we don't want to set the framework to the point where we're sort of not, you know, it's not achievable for the vast majority of projects. Um, so that flexibility, I think, is really important uh, in the framework. And and on that that note, I think of flexibility. I think, you know, I represent an engineering firm. We do engineering work. We we suffer from the malaise of of wanting to build a big gray concrete thing for all of our problems. Um, and I think the incentive structure has fundamentally changed. The conversation has fundamentally changed around nature-based solutions. And we respond as an organization to in the incentives of the market and the incentives of our clients demanding certain solutions. So when our clients demand nature-based solutions, we now have a nature-based solutions division within our company because that's what the market's asking for. So I think the power of policy and the power of ideas of education institutions that are Teaching the new generation is, is, is impactful. I can, I can feel it inside of our organization. We've got a different group of people working on these problems than we had 10 years ago even. Um, and that's hope, I guess, to say that we, the market is responding very quickly because our clients are asking for those things. I have a comment, uh, which is I've, I've been listening to you guys. I mean, a very interesting uh, uh, discussion. Um, and I think... I mean, the, the engineering community, I think uh, the scientific community, social is making a lot of progress and they are, I mean, there's a lot of things, new things that are coming uh, in the pipeline. One thing to me hasn't changed at all for at least 80 years. We're still using the same tool for doing financial analysis. So 
to me is, I mean, I, I think if we keep on looking, I mean, trying to see the overhaul of engineering, I think engineers, we are happy to change all the time. The same thing, I mean, everything. When you look around, I mean, changes and progress is made constantly. But still we go back and we do discounted uh, cash flow models or the, car, uh, the cost benefit analysis that the government, the government uses. And you end up, all the time you're gonna end up with the same results. Anything that is more than 10 years, you're not gonna see the benefits or worse yet, you're not gonna see the tremendous liability we are creating. So you keep on around looking for changing the standards or adopting the standard or whatever, but if you don't really attack, how do you actually model or uh, evaluate your financial impact? Because at the end of the day, one of the biggest filters is going to be economic. And um, nowadays that we have less money available, that's what we're going to be one filter that we're going to look very close. And you like it or not, at the end of the day, most of the solution is going to be towards the less sustainable because probably they are most costly based on these completely outdated financial models. That's in my opinion. If I can answer to that, because that's very much connected to the project that I made reference to in Peru. At the end of the day, so it's either we change the financial models, which I totally agree, or we incorporate other elements as part of the decision-making process. The financial model cannot be 100% of the decision of, is this project gonna move forward or not? But the financial model can be at 20, or 30, or 40%, but also it's like, what are the social benefits that this project is bringing? What are the environmental benefits that this project is bringing? And once we put all that together, then we have a sound decision-making process, it would certainly, we cannot ignore that economic and financial aspect need to be considered because otherwise the project would not be sustainable anyway. Mm -hmm. But also it's not the only thing that we look at, which traditionally for many decades has been the case. So I agree with you. I think that we need to reshape how we decide which projects we develop. Yeah, just a minor point to add on to that, uh, to Christina's point, I think that uh, in the sustainable financing, it's not just like environmentally sustainable, but also financially sustainable, because if a project is not making money, it's not going to work. So not just rethinking the discounted cash flows and other models, but the KPIs of projects and also the financing, whether it's from MDBs, whether it's from governments, all of those linked to those specific outcomes uh, is going to be critical. And then, of course, providing those incentives accordingly. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, I think that's a great point, and I fully agree. Um, you know, and that's something that was baked into the core of the BDN certification framework, right? Element five is about value over the full life cycle of the project, and that value is not just economic value. So the very first requirement is the consideration of all relevant economic, environmental, and social costs and benefits over the life cycle, right? So that's that's you know clearly you ha you have to look not just at the upfront costs, you have to look at the full cost of the project life cycle and consider not just the economic costs, but the social and governance and environmental costs as well. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, I, I, I love the question and the comments. Um, I think it's profoundly true. Um, we have a, a, a financial modeling approach to our infrastructure that tends to devalue long-term thinking. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged to hear Russell, your comment around looking at the, the broader cost impacts across the life cycle and not discounting those, those metrics to a present value um, and devaluing something that's 30 years off in the future because the reality for society and for all of us is that if the, the bridge collapses in year 30 versus year 10, um, you know, is that really any different for the society impacts, the societal impacts that we were all kind of talking about today? Um, the answer is probably it's just as important, if not as important, in year 30 as it is in year 10. And so that fundamental change in how we discount risk from a, it's a long way off in the future, you know, 2050, we talk about that date quite a bit in our day jobs. Um, you know, who's to say that a risk in 2050 isn't the same as, has, doesn't have the same value to us all here in this room, um, to the people that our infrastructure serves, if it were to happen in 2030. So I think, you know, that longer term thinking comes back to a question we had from the audience around long term planning. It comes back to how we value these things, <laughs> making sure that we don't just become a victim to, you know, a three year payback period in our financial model. And we think a little bit broader. Okay. Um, so 
Thank you for that question. That could be easily another hour and a half panel. <laughs> Obviously, that's open. And on that note, um, I will just take a moment to uh, promote. I think when you signed up, you could sign up for um, the Duke's Nicholas Institute for Energy, Environment, and Sustainability newsletter. We actually have done a series, and I believe we have something coming up on this topic, a seminar, am I? Uh, broadly on <laughs> cost-benefit analysis, and particularly this question of nature-based infrastructure, thinking of how we do a better job with this. So please do sign up for our, uh, our newsletter and to virtually or in person uh, be involved. And of course, our partners, ICSI, UNEP, WWF, are all working in this space as well and continuing to focus on a lot of these questions. We didn't get into uh, that particular issue in great depth, but you know, down the road, that's one of the topics that is incredibly important. So um, we are one minute from time and I'm not gonna even ask you all to wrap up, but instead say that we welcome anyone who's here in the room to, uh, I, there's probably still some uh, pastries out there to join us, have another cup of coffee and um, you know, just finish some of these conversations. We only began to really scratch, scratch the surface. So we certainly going to leave it open for the next half hour where we can pick up again, thanking our um, funders, Duke University and the Schmidt Family Foundation. And um, thank especially to these five excellent panelists for a really fun and exciting conversation.